Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Christopher Tubbs. All right. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for the introduction, and thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to share some of our work with you today. Um, so I'm kind of going to give two talks here in one. We're going to talk about some work that's been going on for about the last decade or so, and it's still kind of ongoing. And then I'm going to talk a little bit towards the end about the, um, a new project that San Diego Zoo has launched just, just down the road from us all. So the first part of the talk is a project that I started working on as a postdoc. After graduate school, I went to San Diego Zoo as a postdoc and tried to, to help tackle an issue which was um, basically that southern white rhinos weren't breeding very well in captivity. And so before all that, uh, the southern white rhino really is one of our conservation success stories. Uh, the population in the early 1900s was hunted down to about 100 individuals. Depending on who you read, they say as few as 20. Um, that population uh, or that, that phenomenon actually led to the creation of some of the classic game reserves and parks we know now in, in South Africa. Uh, like Kruger National Park and others. Um, protection in wild habitat um, was really effective, and in about 100 years, the population grew to about 21,000 individuals. Um, that number was, was pretty accurate about probably 10 years ago. Uh, unfortunately, as we'll see in a second, um, that population number is now a little bit lower. So while the wild population did really well, uh, the captive population initially did really well. So in addition to in situ conservation efforts, there were ex situ conservation efforts. And places like San Diego Zoo Safari Park uh, brought in southern white rhinos and sort of served as these assurance populations where rhinos could breed um, and be protected from poaching, which, which was still ongoing for a good part of their early protection. So once people figured out how to manage southern white rhinos in captivity, they actually bred quite well. Um, the safari park is a great example of that. We've had, we just had our 100th southern white rhino born there over the course of our 40, 40 or so years of, of breeding. But what people noticed was that females that were born in captivity had far lower reproductive rates than, than those that were born in the wild. And again, depending on who you read, uh, that, lower, that number can be as low as about 10%. Um, some say as high as 50%. It's probably somewhere in the middle, so I've picked probably less than 33% ever breed um, successfully in captivity if you're born in a captive setting. So why is this important? Well, when I started working on this project, assurance populations probably weren't even necessary because the wild populations had grown and rebounded so well. So I started at the, the safari park in 2007, and what I'm showing you here are poaching deaths in South Africa. Uh, these are primarily white rhinos, but there are some black rhinos included in this data. And that year that I started, only 13 were poached in the wild. And then you can see what happened seven years later. And that number uh, for that particular column is over 1,400 rhinos poached in the wild. So there's a tremendous demand for their horn. Um, it's believed to have um, uh, a lot of uses in traditional medicine. And the demand has, has increased in recent years due to a number of different circumstances. Uh, and the, the poaching rates have escalated. And you can see from this graph that recently, those numbers have come down. Right? Part of that is probably because of, of better protection of rhinos in their native habitat. Um, unfortunately, though, it, that's probably not entirely accurate. The fact is there are just fewer rhinos to poach, right? And they're harder to find, and people aren't as successful. So people have known uh, for, like I said, a few decades that, that captive-born female southern white rhinos struggle to reproduce. And there's a number of different pathologies associated with females being born in captivity that might explain this. Hormonally, they don't cycle like normal, like females that are brought in from the wild. So they either don't produce reproductive hormones in a typical cyclical pattern. Uh, they also have a number of documented reproductive tract issues, either malformations of the reproductive tract or high incidences of tumors or cysts of the reproductive tract. Uh, this figure on your right is the inside of a rhino uterus. UB means uterine body. Uh, and you can see the texture of that kind of looks like a head of broccoli. That's a condition called endometrial hyperplasia. Uh, that's very common in, in captive-born southern white rhinos. Um, and it, it's enough to keep an animal from being able to, to have an embryo implant and maintain a pregnancy. So the leading thought on this and why this was occurring was uh, folks thought that rhinos would come into a managed setting and because they weren't managed properly, or maybe the stress of, of relocating to a managed setting uh, caused them to, to not successfully conceive. And every time they didn't conceive, they would go through another reproductive cycle. And every reproductive cycle is associated with production of high levels of the hormone estrogen. Uh, estrogen's a wonderful hormone, um, but if you're exposed to high levels of it, it can lead to the onset of all sorts of reproductive pathologies. And estrogen, typically, when a rhino is pregnant, is very low. When they're pregnant, they're pregnant for 16 months. and so 
you know, you have basically a year and a half of, of no estrogen production versus a rhino that's continually cycling that would cycle every 30 days to approximately 70 days and expose themselves to, to their endogenous hormone. It's not, not a terrible hypothesis. It was the leading hypothesis for, uh, for decades, but it doesn't account for the things that we're interested in my lab, which is how chemicals in the environment that are exogenous from, from different sources can, can also affect reproduction. So my group studies endocrine disrupting chemicals. They're basically any chemical that can interfere with, with normal hormone function. Um, and luckily for me, I call this job security. There are tons of them in the environment. Uh, there's some pretty classic ones. Uh, this is a, a photograph from Life magazine uh, published in the 1940s. This was supposed to be a very provocative photograph. It's a popular model from the time, uh, standing in a cloud, uh, drinking a Coke and eating a, a hot dog. And that cloud, uh, the reason that this photograph was published is showing that this, this chemical that she's surrounded by is safe. And that chemical is DDT, right? We know now that DDT isn't a safe chemical. It led to the collapse of all sorts of, of avian populations. California uh, still struggles with DDT. We have a DDT hotspot right off um, Palos Verdes. Uh, you know, California condors still struggle with DDT. We now know that, that DDT isn't safe. And one thing that it, that it can do is interfere with endocrine systems to interfere with reproduction. There's another classic example of endocrine disrupting, um, of an endocrine disrupting chemical. Uh, it's a chemical called DES. Has anybody in the room heard of DES? Yes, I'm pretty sure that you have. Uh, so DES was a synthetic estrogen. It was developed in the laboratory uh, to mimic the hormone estrogen. In many cases, it is actually more estrogenic than estrogen itself. So it, it's very good at what it does. And you can see from this advertisement here, it was packaged into prenatal vitamins. Uh, and it was, it was used to prevent abortion, miscarriage, and premature labor. Now, whether it was actually effective in doing that remains to be seen. Um, what we do know now is that if a female was pregnant with a female um, fetus and was taking DES, that fetus was exposed to DES through, through the circulation. And women who were born to, or when those, those babies were born and became of reproductive age themselves, uh, that, that whole cohort uh, basically suffered from all sorts of reproductive issues. They were evil, either um, unable to reproduce, uh, there was a high incidence of early onset reproductive cancers that were often lethal um, at the age of puberty. So a very, very bad chemical to be exposed to, um, you know, and one that is obviously no longer in use. So these stories, especially the DES story, highlights a couple of important things about exposure to EDCs, and that is that timing is critical. Right? We can get exposed to, to endocrine disrupting chemicals as adults, uh, or animals can be exposed as, as mature animals, and oftentimes they might have an effect. Um, but typically, if once the chemical exposure is removed, that effect goes away. Right? And that's because we have all the systems in place to detoxify the chemicals, help us clear the chemicals, uh, and, and get them out of our body. That's not the case when you're a developing embryo. Those systems are being, being put into place and all sorts of other systems as well. The neuroendocrine system is developing and so tiny amounts of, of chemical uh, exposure can actually result in very detrimental and oftentimes permanent effects that can't be reduced or reversed. And so what that means uh, for, for wildlife species and other species is, is when they do become of reproductive age, they never form properly. Um, and, and, and all those systems don't work absolutely correctly, and reproduction can either be a struggle uh, or impossible. So the endocrine disrupting chemicals that we study in my group, or one of the groups of endocrine disrupting chemicals, are phytoestrogens. Now these are completely natural, and they can mimic the hormone estrogen uh, when consumed in high quantities, and we know from other species they can have very detrimental effects, and in, in some cases uh, mimic what we see in our southern white rhinos. So they're found in things like soy and alfalfa and clover. Basically, legumes uh, produce high levels of phytoestrogens. Uh, so clover, which is being shown here. And then typically, a lot of the plants that we feed herbivores in managed settings contain high levels of soy and high levels of alfalfa. So we feed sometimes straight alfalfa hay for certain animals. But almost every herbivore in a zoo setting gets fed some sort of commercial pellet, like this I'm showing here. And if you look at the ingredient list, um, Typically, the first five to 10 ingredients are some soy or alfalfa-based product. So we know from sheep, uh, this is a huge issue in sheep. It almost caused, phytoestrogens almost caused the collapse of the, the sheep population in Western Australia in the 1940s. Uh, of course, you can do excellent uh, studies, uh, you know, dosing studies with rodents and, and mice that you can't do in something like a rhino, but we know a lot about how phytoestrogens work from, from studies in laboratory species. Um, horses. 
uh, people are starting to study phytoestrogen effects on horses. Horses get a lot of alfalfa uh, and, and alfalfa-based products. Uh, there's some, some excellent work that's done in California quail showing that seasonal fluctuations in phytoestrogens can affect reproduction. And then, of course, given all these studies we know in other animals and the likelihood that we're exposing rhinos to phytoestrogens, we thought naturally to pursue these, these chemicals in rhinos. So here's what we think is going on. We think that female rhinos can be brought in from the wild and can be fed high levels of, of phytoestrogens in their diet, and it doesn't really have any ill effect. Uh, that's because, like I said previously, all those systems are in place to detoxify and clear those chemicals. However, that's probably not the case for a rhino embryo. This is not a rhino embryo, um, but it looks like a rhino embryo because we all look like that at that point. So what we think is that developing rhino embryos or fetuses are exposed to phytoestrogen through mom's diet. And what that results in is her having an inability or difficulty uh, getting pregnant and, and having calves later on in life when she becomes a reproductive age. So this is a tricky challenge to tackle in rhinos, right? Rhinos are not mice and rodents. We can't do the types of experiments that you can do with, with mice and rodents. And so as Jennifer mentioned, we look at how these chemicals interact with the proteins that regulate reproduction. I'm not gonna go too deeply into that, um, but what that allows us to do is basically look at the suite of phytoestrogens in diets and measure their overall estrogenicity or how estrogenic they are and, and use that as a proxy for the potential they might have to cause reproductive harm. So we did a ton of work, uh, molecular biology type work, to, to sort this out. Um, that type of work is mind numbing because it produces lots and lots of graphs and it is not something zoo nutritionists want to see to make a, make a diet change. It's not particularly convincing to them. So what we did is, is we actually did a, a diet survey of nine different institutions across North America that either historically have been fantastic uh, rhino breeding institutions or, or currently rhino breeding institutions and manage their animals in a way that promote like pretty much the best rhino breeding behavior and, and environment that we can. So we looked at those institutions, we went through their breeding records going back to the 1960s and then we asked them for samples of their diets and we measured estrogenicity of their diets. And for rhinos that were born in the wild, this is the relationship that we saw. So this graph here on the x-axis shows you estrogenicity uh, so you can think of that as phytoestrogen level. And then on the y-axis is fertility, and that's basically just the number of calves born to a female white rhino per reproductive year that, that she was alive. And this is the relationship that we found. Now, statistically, it's not significant, but it actually sort of trends upward, right? We, we weren't necessarily expecting this, um, but, but what we think is going on here is Estrogenicity of diet is proportional to the amount of pellets that you feed your animals. So for example, at the safari park, we used to feed every rhino 25 pounds of pellet per day. Some places don't feed any pellet at all. Um, but when you feed a lot of pellet, you are giving them a lot of phytoestrogen, but you're also giving them a lot of other beneficial nutrients. And nutrition, you know, increased nutrition plane can, can promote reproduction up to a point. And we believe that that's what we're seeing here. We don't have many institutions or really any institutions that have morbidly obese rhinos, you know, where you would expect reproduction to, to suffer or be compromised. So we think this is a function of, of the amount of nutrition that we're giving these animals. Here's what we found for females that were born in captivity. So same type of graph, uh, and you can see the line goes in a, in a completely different direction, um, suggesting that, that the more estrogenic your diet is, or the more estrogenic your mom's diet is, and the diet that you're exposed to, the less likely you are to reproduce in your lifetime, regardless of whether you're moved from that institution or to another institution. So we actually track these females through their lifetime. So what are we doing about it? So our rhinos, if you've been to the safari park, you know they live in a mixed species herd. They have access to their food. They're, they're fed a tub of food every day. And when they finish that, they go on and eat whoever else's food they want to because they're the rhinos and a gazelle's not gonna stop them from going to the gazelle feeder. So the, the initial fix was pretty simple. Uh, keepers got out there and drilled holes in our, in our mixed species feeders and just put big metal bars in there so the rhinos couldn't get their large heads in there and hoover up everybody else's pellet. So I like to think of like the eight years of complex molecular biology we did to solve this problem, and that's the solution. <laughs> we also worked with our nutrition department to develop a new pellet. You have to feed in, in most settings some sort of pellet to get those other nutrients that, that the animals need. Um, even though rhinos are grazers in the wild and eat almost predominantly grass, they have to be supplemented in managed settings. So we worked with them to, to make a new pellet and change how we feed our animals. 
So the, the graph on the right is the estrogenicity of our old diet. We were third highest on, on the list of institutions that we tested. And the figure above that is a, is a real life pie chart of what they were fed. So you can see that pile of food is half, half hay, half pellet. So about 25 pounds of hay and about 25 pounds of pellet. And that is quite a bit of pellet. Uh, rhinos eat about 50 pounds of food a day. Um, so we developed a new pellet. We eliminated almost completely soy and alfalfa ingredients. The only soy ingredient in our pellet now is maybe a little bit, in, a little bit, bit of soybean oil that's contained in vegetable oil. Um, but we now feed about 90% hay and about 10% pellet per animal. And you can see that the, the level of estrogenicity of that diet dropped significantly um, so that we're now actually feeding the lowest phytoestrogen diet um, of the institutions that we tested. So we tracked the reproductive cycles of all our rhinos and have done so for years. So what I'm showing you here is a graph of the hormone progesterone. So progesterone is a hormone that's elevated uh, in short term during ovulation, but long term during, during pregnancy. Uh, this is a graph from one of our females named Holly. She had actually um, conceived two calves before, but lost both of them, um, actually gave birth to both of them, and they were stillborn. Um, that's unfortunate, but it, it's not necessarily uncommon with southern white rhinos. Um, and then she, she stopped. She, she didn't conceive for about 10 years that, that we're aware of. So what you can see here is progesterone levels are very low. Uh, and you can see from those notations on the graph, Holly was doing everything she needed to do to get pregnant. She was breeding proven males. Um, you know, she was, she was engaging in, in reproductive behavior, uh, but, but with no success. And in the beginning of 2014, where that dotted line is, uh, that's when we put in our exclusion feeders. And about 10 to 12 months, it's kind of hard to tell after that, we noticed this. So that's an elevated level of progesterone. Those are pregnancy levels there. And you can see from the little octagon uh, notation on the end there, uh, she gave birth to this guy. So this is Masamba. Um, Masamba in Chichuan uh, actually means Chris. Not buying it? Yeah. So, so that's not true at all. Um, and it, it, Masamba uh, actually means leaf or foliage, and the keepers name our animals, right? And we have great relationships with our keepers, and I, I just, I saw this and I was like, oh, that's great, you know, leaf or foliage. They're paying tribute to our work on the diets and what we're feeding these. Yeah, that's not true either. Um, he actually has a, a pattern on his forehead that looks just like a leaf. So they named him Masamba. No respect for the scientists. This is another female in our herd. This is Kiazi, and Kiazi is a classic captive-born female southern white rhino in that she bred her entire, from, from when she became reproductively active, uh, for probably eight to 10 years uh, with, with no success. Uh, she was actually gestated at institution number nine. So she was gestated in the highest phytoestrogen institution that we analyzed in, in our study um, and, and sort of fit our, our hypothesis really, really well. Um, Kiazi was actually the first to get pregnant after the diet change. So again, a graph of progesterone. You can see she had an elevation of progesterone, but you can see there's no notation of, of her giving birth. She actually uh, delivered her calf about two months premature and stillborn, which uh, happened when I was on a flight. And we, you know, a rhino pregnancy is nothing if it's not a lesson in patience, right? 16 months and you watch progesterone levels stay up and you get new data every couple of weeks. And, you know, you're waiting for a year and a half to see if it's everything's gonna to come to fruition. And unfortunately in this case, it, it didn't. Um, but she stayed out there in, in our breeding herd, uh, bred again, and showed another elevation in progesterone, got pregnant another time, and this showed up. So this is Ellen, she gave birth to a female calf. Um, pretty, pretty exciting. The cool thing about about Kiazi is she got pregnant for the first time at about 15, uh, 14 or 15 years old. Typically, if a rhino is not pregnant by 10 to 12, their chances of getting pregnant are, are almost zero. So for her to be able to get pregnant actually twice, carry a calf to term, uh, was super exciting news for us. Uh, and I'm happy to report that actually both Holly and Kiazi are currently pregnant and we're expecting calves in the early summer from both of them. So that's, that's pretty exciting news. You know, with, with the two females getting pregnant initially after the diet change, you feel, you feel good, you know, but statistically, uh, an N of two is not particularly strong. Uh, for them to be able to, an N of four is not that strong either, but for them to be able to get pregnant a second time is, is very encouraging. Uh, we, of course, share this information with, with other zoos, and I know of four or five other places that have reduced phytoestrogens in their diets, um, and that's been associated with the birth of calves. So that's, that's exciting. 
So that's led us to rethink this hypothesis a little bit where phytoestrogen exposure uh, basically makes females um, infertile for the rest of their life. So that's, that's obviously not the case. Both Holly and, and Kiazi were able to, you know, they were, they were captive born females that were able to get pregnant after a diet change. You know, I must say there's, there's other females that are out in our herd who also went through the diet change that haven't reproduced. So I don't think that this is a fix for everybody. Um, but I, th I think we might be able to, to tip the balance with some of these females just enough so that they can have a calf. And that's great for the North American population because we need about eight to 10 calves born a year to maintain genetic diversity in the captive population that's, that's sufficient for, for long-term um, captive breeding. And we usually fall a couple rhinos short. So if we get a couple more females pregnant who haven't been represented before genetically, that's, that's fantastic. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and uh, talk about uh, a new project that launched in earnest in, in 2015. You've probably seen a little bit about this in the news. It's, it's been picked up by the press quite a bit. Uh, I must start by saying that I am only one person of many, many who work on this project, so I'm, I'm sort of the messenger today. Uh, I'm not taking credit for, for all this work. We have an incredible team. Um, there's probably nobody within the organization that um, isn't touched by this project, and, and so I'm happy to share that with you today. Uh, the project is called our Northern White Rhino Initiative, and its goal is to bring the Northern White Rhino back from the brink of extinction. So Northern White Rhinos and Southern White Rhinos are, are closely related. They're, they're subspecies of white rhino. Um, there are currently only two Northern White Rhinos left in the world. They're in a, in a reserve in Kenya, uh, and this is what their daily life looks like. Uh, they're in a, in a protected area. They have 24-7 armed guards. Um, this is actually a picture of the last remaining male northern white rhino, Sudan, who if you, if you were paying attention to the news in 28, um, you, you'll probably remember that, that he passed away. And so now we have two females left, their mother and daughter. Um, you don't have to be an expert in biology to realize that's not how you bring a population of mammals back, right? Here are the last two females, Najin and um, Fatu. And again, they're, they're in, in Kenya under 24-hour under watch. Um, and the, the mom is probably post-reproductive. She's probably too old to conceive. Uh, the female is getting there, um, you know, but, but there's no males to, to breed them with, so, so that's a big hurdle. And so I feel like the northern white rhino highlights uh, something that, that we're facing more and more in conservation biology is, is, you know, there's more and more challenges every day coming up that, that are going to require unique solutions to them. So we're, we're in the sixth extinction, you know, extinction rates now are uh, incredibly high. It's, it's primarily human driven. You know, and so, so the northern white rhino isn't the only species facing this kind of thing. All vertebrates, invertebrates, you know, all life on the planet potentially is, is, is being challenged by what's going on in the world now. And so we're facing things obviously like climate change. It's a, that's a huge challenge. It's gonna take a creative solution to hopefully fix. Um, pollution is, is a massive issue. Uh, you know, it can, it can lead to things like, like what we study, endocrine disruption in different species, but also can have just straight up lethal effects on, on animals. And then of course, in the case of, of things like rhinos and elephants, poaching is, is, uh, runs unchecked in, in many parts of the world and is, is in many cases the wildlife trade and poaching is, is a primary challenge facing a lot of these species that, that we work with. So San Diego Zoo has a long history of breeding rhinos. We started in, in earnest in 1972 and you can, see, you can see our statistics there. We had our 100th southern white rhino born just recently. I'll have to peek. We have 70 greater one horned rhinos and 14 eastern black rhinos. Um, the, the northern white rhino was originally brought out of the wild and placed in zoos in Europe to, to try to develop these assurance populations in, in captive breeding efforts. Uh, and, and they were unsuccessful. And given San Diego Zoo's history with white rhinos at the time, they were actually sent to us, a, a group of them, so that we could try to breed them. But unfortunately, it was probably a little too late. They were, they were fairly advanced in age. And of course, as I just highlighted in the, the previous section, we might not have been managing them and feeding them in the way that's, that best promotes reproduction. Uh, and so we were never able to successfully breed the northern white rhino. And as a result, um, the, the organization and our, our former CEO uh, uh, dedicated um, a number of resources to try to do what we can to try to save the northern white rhino. <laughs> So Nola was our last southern white, our northern white rhino that we had uh, in our care. She passed away uh, a few years ago at the age of 45 or, or more. She lived a, 
a long, happy life at the safari park, but um, unfortunately we were never able to, to breed her and she's sort of become the icon for this project. And so two females that are closely related, mother and daughter, uh, like I said, is not how you bring a population back. So it seems like extinction of the northern white rhino is, is eminent, but maybe not. So we're looking at stem cell technology to, to try to figure out a way that, to, to bring these species back. And stem cells, just like this cartoon says, is like all of us when we were kids. You know, you could be anything you want to be uh, as a stem cell if you, if you know how to become the right type of cell. So stem cells are, cell, are cells that are pluripotent. They can, they can develop into any, any, certain, any kind of cell type given um, the, right, the right programming uh, within the cell. Uh, or they can also just continue to be stem cells and, and renew themselves um, in perpetuity. But they give rise to all the cell types that are, that are in our body eventually and, and therefore are critically important in, in this project because we might be able to get them to develop in cell, into cell types that we can then use to save this species. And this was a major breakthrough uh, that, um, that scientists in Japan worked out in mice where they were able to take fibroblast cells, which are cells that just sort of sit within our connective tissue and help hold our bodies together along with our skeleton. Uh, they were able to, to add certain genes into these cells and reprogram those cells, basically rewind their development back into stem cells, into pluripotent stem cells, that they were then able to, to then program to develop sperm and egg. And now we're getting somewhere. So if you have a sperm and you have an egg, in theory, in vitro, you can make an embryo. If you have an embryo, you can transfer it to a surrogate and get a surrogate to carry that embryo, maybe to term and, and to produce a calf. Because the southern white rhino is so closely related to the northern white rhino, they're, they're subspecies, we feel that southern white rhinos could be a, a suitable and promising species to use as surrogates if we can figure out how to make northern white rhino embryos. Sounds pretty easy, right? <laughs> So this is where our frozen zoo comes in. So the frozen zoo is, um, this is the frozen zoo. It is, it is completely, well, to me, it's pretty unremarkable looking for what it is. Uh, somebody commented that it looks like a dairy, and it sort of looks like a dairy. It is, it is a collection of cells and tissues that has been, um, that was started about 40 years ago and has been continually added to. Uh, we currently have fibroblast lines from over 1,000 species in there. Right? So it, it, in many ways, is the densest collection of living vertebrate life on the planet. Uh, and it's like three doors down from my office. It's a pretty, pretty cool thing to think about. Uh, we have cell lines from 12 northern white rhinos banked in the frozen zoo, viable cell lines, living cells from northern white rhinos um, that, that are actually what we're using to, to, try to try to move this project forward. And this is what fibroblasts look like. Again, if you've seen cells in a microscope, they're, they're pretty standard. Uh, they can be pretty hardy. They can be difficult to work with. It seems like all cell lines kind of have their, um, their own personality, if you will. Um, but we have these 12 cell lines from northern white rhinos uh, banked, and we can continue to grow them. Uh, in, in theory, we have an endless supply of them because you can take them out of the frozen zoo, grow up more, and, and freeze some back and continue to do that over and over again. Um, but again, 12 animals is, is not a lot to try to bring a population back from. It's been done before. Uh, if you're familiar with the story of the California condor, uh, our current condor population comes from about 14 founder birds. Uh, and, and if you know what, what the condor um, story is these days, the condors are doing really well. We have almost 500 condors. Uh, over half of them are free flying and in the wild. They're heavily managed, but they are a, a species that you know, shows that, that if you have enough genetic diversity to, bring, to, bring, um, you know, to grow that population, that you could be OK. So that was one of the first things our conservation genetics group did, is they sequenced the entire genome of our 12 northern white rhino cell lines and assessed genetic diversity. And that's, that's what this figure here shows. So this is a measure of heterozygosity. It's, it's just, you can think of it as genetic diversity. Uh, and you can see that, that the northern white rhino actually has more genetic diversity than the southern white rhino lines that they also sequenced at the same time. So we know the southern white rhino went from a, from a very small population size to a very large population size and is, is healthy. You know, they're, they're reproducing just fine. Unfortunately, they're just getting poached. So this gives us hope that these cell lines that we have, these fibroblast lines, are sufficient to, to generate embryos um, and, and try to bring the northern white rhino back. Here's me and Nola. This, this is a banned picture. You're not supposed to have free contact with rhinos, but she's pretty sweet. She didn't mind. 
Uh, and this is, this is just a, a schematic from the San Diego um, Union Tribune showing what, what our approach is. And that is to, to take these fibroblast lines, to add the genes back into them that, that can reprogram them into stem cells, to get those stem cells to develop then into sperm and egg. We have to figure out what those pathways are, to use those sperm and egg to make an embryo, and with that embryo, then transfer it into a southern white rhino surrogate, and hopefully um, carry, carry the pregnancy to term. So this is a schematic that's from a paper that was published, I think, in 2017, showing sort of how we can get there. And there's two ways we can do it. We can do it with constructed gametes, which are on the left. Those would be the stem cell-derived gametes, the sperm and the eggs. Uh, and there's potential to use natural gametes. We also have some reproductive tissue from northern white rhinos in the frozen zoo, as do, do other people around the world um, in, in limited quantity, but, but potentially enough that could be useful. And so these are a bunch of techniques that, that all need to happen in order to get to that ultimate goal of a southern white rhino calf and a self-sustaining population. So this is obviously an extremely long-term long -term project. Now, all of these techniques are developed in other species, but obviously they're not gonna be all developed in rhinos, right? Rhinos are tricky to work with for a number of different reasons. And so this is what we're currently unable to do in rhinos. So you can see we're roadblocked at the moment. Um, but, but certain things have, have come along <laughs> and, and we're, we're starting to make progress. If you think that this project has, has only been going on for four years, uh, you'll see what we're able to do or have been able to do. And, and I think we're making pretty good progress. Some of the things that we were potentially able to do when, when this project started are no longer available to us. That the last male northern white rhino passed away and we were not able to collect sperm from him. So that opportunity is lost. However, there's another technique down on the lower right hand side called ovum or oocyte pickup. That's where you're actually able to go into uh, the animal with a, with a machine and go to the, to the ovary and actually pluck the follicles off the surface of the ovary. And that's a technique that we have a collaborator in South Africa doing. He's doing it routinely. And there's other groups in Europe that are doing it routinely. So that's, that's, that's a hurdle that we've now overcome, right? So we're going to lose some options. We're going to gain some options. Um, but over the, over the course of the project, hopefully we can eliminate enough barriers to, to get to that goal. Uh, you've probably seen in the news recently that they have done ovum pickup on the northern white rhinos left in, in Kenya. And there has been some work on the in vitro aspects, so the, the oocyte maturation and fertilization in vitro. That's done by a group out of Germany. Um, they're the only ones doing it now in very, very, very low numbers. Um, but, but their progress is promising, so eventually we, we expect to see a lot of those those red boxes or circles up there disappear. In terms of the induced pluripotent stem cell route, this at this, this point in time is our most promising route to, to get to sperm and eggs. And this is done again by our conservation genetics group, which I've shown down there. Um, it's, it's quite a process. We have the 12 fibroblast lines. Um, to reprogram them into stem cells takes about three months to, to do that successfully. Um, to validate them takes about uh, another month or so. Um, we don't know how long it's going to take to make them into primordial germ cells or PGCs. Those are the cells that eventually give rise to sperm and or egg. Uh, we have to figure that out. Folks are working on it in other species, so there's some, some models to follow. Uh, and there's a plan to do that. We're just not there yet. And then, of course, to get to functional gametes that can produce a viable embryo, again, we're, that's, that's something we're just going to have to figure out over the next, the next couple of decades. Uh, I am happy to say that, that our conservation genetics group is doing a great job uh, making stem cells. And of the, of the 12 lines that we've had, they've successfully been able to reprogram nine of them. So, so we actually have, have stem cells from northern white rhinos, which, which can help support this project. So a good question that, that people often ask, are these stem cells like really induced pluripotent stem cells? And um, to, to kind of kind of show you where we've where we've gone with that, uh, we have to have a little embryology lesson. So this is an embryo, an early developing embryo, and, and basically an early developing embryo comes from three different germ layers. Um, you can see there the endoderm, the mesoderm, and the ectoderm, and they all give rise to, to different tissue types within the body. So the endoderm becomes our digestive system, et cetera. Uh, the mesoderm, our circulatory system, and the ectoderm, things like our hair, our nails, and our nervous system. Um, one of the cool things about stem cells is when you culture them, some of them will differentiate spontaneously, just sort of randomly into different, um, different tissue types or, or different germ layers, or these, these ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm layers. 
And so one of the first things our conservation genetics group wanted to do was to see if that was happening to our stem cells um, in vitro. So they're able to treat those cells with different markers. Uh, those markers can tell you, they basically identify which genes are turned on in those cells and can tell you uh, if it's an ectoderm cell, uh, mesoderm, or, or endoderm. And they've been able to identify spontaneous differentiation for each of the three germ layers, right? So um, this is great. This, this kind of helps show that, that these induced pluripotent stem cells are induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, and if you look at that figure on, on the right, remember I said that ectoderm gives rise to nerve cells? So those are nerve fibers that have spontaneously generated in culture, uh, and those cells are actually from NOLA. So um, yeah, we have NOLA nerve cells now in the dish. Uh, this is great. Um, however, you want to be able to control that differentiation. You don't want to have to wait and say, oh, we'll see if a sperm or an egg shows up. It, it would never happen. Um, so we have to figure out what the, what the particular pathways are for, for the stem cells that we're interested in and move forward from there. But as, a, as sort of a proof of principle, uh, a lot of people work on stem cells for different reasons. It's very popular in regenerative, regenerative medicine um, and, and specifically uh, studying uh, heart function and, and cardiomyocytes. And so you can actually go to a, a, a biological reagent company and buy a kit that can turn stem cells into cardiomyocytes. It's something that's commercially available. So they decided to buy one of those kits and treat our rhino stem cells with this kit and see what happened. Um, and just, just to prove that you can develop specific types from the stem cells that they've, they've generated. So this is a dish of fibroblasts that were turned into stem cells from Angelifu, who was our last male northern white rhino. Uh, they ran them through this cardiomyocyte process, and this is what was observed under the microscope. So those are cardiomyocytes doing their spontaneous beating in, in culture, right? So, so it does look like the pluripotent stem cells we were, able, we were able to generate are, in fact, stem cells. So my group, I work with the Reproductive Sciences Group, and, and we're involved in this project quite heavily because we're helping to develop the techniques that we need to get to that end goal of, of a northern white rhino calf. Um, so we spend a lot of time working hands-on with our rhinos at our rhino rescue center, which I'm showing here. Um, one, to develop these techniques, and two, just to learn a lot about the reproductive biology of white rhinos. There's really not a ton known, and there's just some basic information that's lacking that, that, that we need to, to figure out, like tracking ovarian cycles. Um, you know, how often, you know, how often do they have a 30-day cycle versus a cycle that might be a different length? Um, you know, when an animal's pregnant, how long does it take before you can visualize an embryo? All sorts of things like that. And so for this project, we imported six southern white rhinos from Africa who arrived at the end of 2015. Um, these, are, these are those girls going out on exhibit for the first day and, and checking out their new habitat. And they're very much, I used to joke all the time, like I would never have a rhino, you know, we would never have a rhino um, research colony. But we actually have a rhino research colony now. We have, we have six animals um, that we work with on a daily basis. Uh, we work with them in a, in a facility that's specially designed. This is a shoot where they go in for reproductive exams. Uh, reproductive exams typically are done by ultrasound. It's transrectal. Uh, that's exactly what it sounds like. You visualize uh, through the rectum, the ovary, and the oviducts. And so this is, this is what our day-to-day -day looks like uh, in that shoot. Um, you can see that shoot gives access to, to the, the ends of the animals that we need. Um, as I said, we brought them in from South Africa. We chartered a flight and flew them in. Uh, so they all came over. They landed right at San Diego Airport, which um, is a very short runway, and that's a very big plane. So we were lucky to get them there. And they were then shipped up to the safari park. And you know, one of the first things that we had to do was get them used to the facility. They didn't know each other. They didn't come from the same herd. They all came from different reserves in Africa or, or semi-managed areas. Uh, and they were going into a facility that was foreign to them. So they, they came in at night. And the first part of this whole process was, was to get them comfortable with, with what was going on in their new home uh, and to meet their trainers. Uh, so we have five dedicated trainers uh, for this project. Um, I'm going to show you in a minute all the fun things that, that they do with these rhinos. These trainers are fantastic. Uh, and it's not hyperbole when I say that these are the best trained rhinos in the world. Our, it's phenomenal what they're able to, to do. But before I show you the training, one of the first things we did is we conducted comprehensive reproductive exams on all females. We, we got these animals to be surrogates. We wanted to make sure that they didn't exhibit any reproductive pathology or issues. Uh, so every animal went through a, a comprehensive reproductive exam. Um, if you've not been to a rhino procedure at the safari park, and I'm guessing many of you haven't, 
Uh, it takes a village. Uh, we have veterinary staff. We have animal care managers. We've got researchers. You know, our trainers are there. Um, I think the most people I've counted at a procedure at one time was 76 people. Uh, so the rhino is immobilized, and all sorts of basic uh, medical workups are done on them. Then, of course, the reproductive exams, um, the procedures, depending on on how you know how what we're trying to accomplish, can be quite short or or in some cases quite lengthy. Um, and so, basically, what we found for our our six females is that they are all um, reproductively sound um, and and great animals for this particular program. Like I said, training is everything for us. All those ultrasounds that are done, they're done in a chute. The chute is not a squeeze chute. They stand and they can move around. Uh, it is their choice to participate in the ultrasound. And um, even though they're in a chute, if a rhino doesn't want to participate, it's not going to participate. And they make you well aware of that. Uh, luckily, our rhinos came from Africa during one of the largest drought periods in their history. And I think that led to them being highly food motivated because they will do anything for a bucket of grass or apples or carrots or a little bit of that, that pellet. So they're, they're, they're completely, um, you know, they, they love human contact and care. In many cases, they act like puppy dogs. Uh, they love a good scratch with a brush. Like this is all behaviors that are being, that are being done with these rhinos to build trust between them and their keepers because every rhino has a primary keeper that they work with and, and it takes the trust between the, care, uh, the trainer and the animal um, to make training progress. Uh, they're trying to go up in the chute, uh, and that is a, that's actually an x-ray um, plate, so they can go into the chute for foot x-rays. Um, they're trained to open their mouths. They know their own names. Um, they can defecate on command. I mean, these are, these are complex things. <laughs> um, and so, so mouth, mouth opening behaviors are huge because uh, it allows us to look at, they don't have any incisors. All their teeth are, are molars in the back, but by training this behavior, you can, you can do dental exams. Uh, they go in the chute, like I said, for the ultrasounds. You can see from the looks on the keepers' faces, they love their jobs. They're, they're just happy to be there, and they're all excellent at what they do, and they collect a lot of poop for us. So we, we study hormones and, and rhino feces, and usually when we work in a zoo setting with endangered species, we're sample limited. Not the case when you're working with rhino poop. You know, we have, we have plenty of material to work with. Uh, they can volunteer blood draws, which is, which is huge. Um, you know, our animals in the field at the safari park, they're essentially wild. You cannot get hands on them. Uh, these girls will come up and you can draw blood from their foot, from their ear. Um, and then, of course, that's the ultrasound. Um, they, they're, they go through transrectal ultrasounds. They do, uh, depending on where they are in the reproductive program, two to three a week uh, for about 15 to 20 minutes at a time. Um, and, and stand there the whole time just eating food like we're not even doing what we're doing. It's pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, when an animal is pregnant, uh, we can actually do ultrasound externally or abdominally. Uh, we don't always get to see what we're looking for because um, a rhino skin is quite thick and a rhino body is very large and a rhino calf can hide very well in there. Um, but sometimes we can. So what we found with our females is most of them were non-ovulatory, which means they were growing follicles in their ovaries, but they weren't actually ovulating the egg. And that, of course, is critical to, to being able to, to reproduce. Now, our goal with these six females is to get them all pregnant and have calves. We want proven females before we transfer an embryo in, into anything. So, so getting these animals pregnant is, is our number one priority. And we want to be the ones to do it. We want to develop the artificial insemination techniques uh, we have plenty of bulls at the facility that would happily do the job for us, um, but we want to be the ones to, to develop these techniques so we can apply them to, to other species, other rhino species, and then other animals at facilities that don't have bulls. Um, but, but when you're not ovulating, that's a challenge. And actually, one of our females was ovulating. Um, so we had one, non or one ovulatory, and the rest were non-ovulatory. So our first challenge was trying to figure out how to make non-ovulatory females ovulatory. And that's, that's been done before uh, by some other groups. And, and basically, you treat with hormones to, at a certain stage to, to get ovulation to happen. So this is an ultrasound of a rhino ovary. The, the first frame there in A is a follicle that's about uh, 30 millimeters or 3 centimeters in, in diameter. That's a mature, ready-to-ovulate follicle. And most of our females, they would grow them to that size, they wouldn't ovulate, and then they'd regress. So we began by treating with hormones when they're at that stage. Um, and by 48 hours, you can see that that follicle is gone. Right? So, so that little blob structure that's in that red circle is, is the beginning of uh, a corpus luteum. That's the ovulation site. And um, that's excellent for us to be able to do that, because now we can get these females that wouldn't be able to reproduce uh, otherwise to reproduce. And we're able to do this with a, with a success rate of about 90%, which is, which is pretty nice. 
So once we're able to get them to ovulate, we then follow up with artificial insemination. So artificial insemination is done in rhinos, or has been done, but not very routinely and not very successfully. Uh, and again, it takes a village. So the first thing we need to do is we need a semen sample, right? So we have, we have bulls at the facility that are our donors. Uh, that, that process is a process, uh, the process we use to, to collect semen is electroejaculation. It's used in a number of species and humans. Uh, we're basically a probe, uh, uh, electrically stimulates the prostate and allows for a sample collection. So we collect the sample, we analyze it there on site. Um, to make sure that the sperm are modal and do a quick count to make sure that we, we have enough for an artificial insemination. We try to deposit at least a billion sperm in every, every insemination. Um, so sperm is evaluated, then it's run back to the lab. It's prepared for the artificial insemination. Uh, it's put in different medias and buffers to, to help prolong its, its motility. And when that's happening, then the females go in for a standing sedation. So a standing sedation is sort of this tricky anesthetic procedure where you want to get an animal sleepy enough that it, it's not aware of what you're doing, but not so sleepy that they go down, because we need them elevated to, to perform the, the, uh, the procedure. So once the standing sedation is on, we call the lab. The lab runs the, the prepared semen sample back. And this is what an artificial insemination looks like in a rhino. It's pretty crowded back there. Um, most people don't realize there's actually three people in that picture. One is past a catheter through the rhino cervix, and that's probably the trickiest part because a rhino cervix is about that big and it's not a straight line, it's very curvy. Once the catheter is passed, they then perform an ultrasound to visualize. We try to get the catheter into the oviduct, and then a third person takes and, and connects the syringe with the, the semen into the catheter and deposits, in, deposits it into the oviduct. Like I said, you wait for 16 months. At about 18 days, that's the earliest we've seen our first embryonic vesicle, and that's what, what I'm showing here. There's no, no real um, dominant uh, embryonic structure in there, but it, but it is evidence of a, of a fertilized egg. And I think this video was taken at about, I can't remember if it's 50 or 100 days, um, but eventually you can visualize the embryo. And so what you're seeing there is the embryo, and the red and the blue, if you've seen an ultrasound before, indicate blood flow. So we're actually seeing blood being, being pumped through the embryo. And then once the calf gets bigger, you can visualize the entire thing. So it's pretty easy to make out what's, what's going on there. That's a, that's a rhino fetus. And this one's a little trickier, but you can see the head and the jaws uh, and the teeth as, as the animal gets older. Once it gets to a certain point, we're not able to, to visualize it very well uh, transrectally. Like I said, we can sometimes do abdominal ultrasounds, but, um, but oftentimes we, we don't see much or we'll just see movement. And then if all goes well, this shows up. So this is Edward. Uh, Edward is the first successful artificial insemination southern white rhino birth in North America. Uh, and he was born last year, I believe in July. And this is his first day out on exhibit with his mom. It's the first time either of them had gone out on exhibit after spending uh, about a month and a half or more in the barn. <laughs> or you can see why we, we named him, we nicknamed him the tank puppy. So he was born, he weighed about 149 pounds uh, on his second day of birth, and within a month, he doubled his weight. Uh, and now, if he's not over 1,000 pounds, he probably is pretty, pretty close to it. It's a, it's a bit of a lengthy video, but it's worth it because they find some mud. So rhinos love to wallow, um, especially on a nice hot summer day. Uh, and yeah, he's, he's pretty, pretty content out there with mom in the mud. Uh, so that was Edward. Um, right, after, right after we performed the procedure on Edward's mom, Victoria, we did another one on another female named Imani, and we've actually had our second um, 
second calf born by artificial insemination. And that's this calf here. That's, her name is Future. She's named after um, a, long, a long-standing donor to the, to the zoo who supported reproductive sciences for uh, more than 40 years. So there's Future. So we've had a male and a female. Um, we've performed a number of artificial inseminations. Our success rate is not super high, um, but every day we're you know, continuing to, to monitor and, and trying to improve those. So just to wrap up, um, you know, with this project, like I said in the beginning, these, these conservation challenges that we face are, are causing us to come up with unique and creative solutions. And, and of course, I, I hope you feel like, you know, using stem cells from fibroblasts to try to make a species that's functionally extinct is a pretty unique and, and creative approach. But based on that pathway, there's multiple ways that, that we can get there. So that, that sort of hopefully increases our, our potential for success. Um, there's a ton of challenges ahead. This is a decades long process. It will probably see um, people currently involved through the end of their career and probably me through the end of my career before it, it's ultimately successful. Um, but San Diego Zoo is sort of uniquely situated to get involved in these long-term projects. The California condor is a, is a great example of that. We've been, we've been in the condor business for, for decades now and, and you know, along with many other partners have really helped bring that species around. You know, I think these non-traditional approaches, boy, they tend to get slammed in the media pretty hard when you, when you first propose them. Um, but, but really, in, in some cases, it's going to be our only option. There, there, there are no other options with, with the northern white rhino. And, um, you know, they, they probably long-term have significant conservation value. And if, if you think about this project for northern white rhino, uh, every rhino species is, is still threatened uh, and likely going to need our assistance at some time unless something happens with poaching in the wild. Um, Sumatran rhinos are probably below 50 individuals. Uh, Javan rhinos have, I think, 60 to 70 individuals left. They're not any in managed care, um, but, but that potential exists to help those species as well. Uh, and with that, I'll thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, I'll be happy to take any questions you might have.